involved with diving a purpose, but we have not established that relationship. And I looked, you know, just passing by because I always go to the, I live in Florida, so he dive in the Keys and I saw the museum. I was like, oh, wow, this is a cool place. And Aubrey and I both love antiques, so especially nautical antiques. And we saw the place, I was like, wow, I want to come in here in the middle of the night and take some of this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've had people do that. <laughs> so those helmets and all that, I was like, wow, this is so super cool. But then, of course, we got, we got um, established with, uh, you know, allowing us to celebrate our 15th anniversary, meaning Diving with a Purpose, last year. And that just set it off to me, you know, um, allowing us to, to celebrate our 15th anniversary with you guys. I mean, it, it just took us to another level. And I can't thank you enough. And for the first time this year, I actually joined the museum. Yes, thank you, thank you. We, thank you. Yes, yes. <clears throat> we, uh, hey, we hey Eric, this is Bob Murray. Uh, I just saw on Harvard that they had a Diving with a Purpose 15th anniversary thing that Harvard University was showing. So congratulations on that. Yeah, and speaking of that, we're actually doing a panel discussion tomorrow. With okay, that's what I saw. That's what I saw. Yes, yes. Yeah. So myself and Jay will be on a panel tomorrow, as well as a couple of uh, Dr. Jones and Dr. Uh, Ayana Llewellyn. She'll be on there too as well. So cool. Yeah, I'll, if you I'll, can I'll come in and join us. Yeah. Cool. Almost as impressive as being with the History of Diving Museum. Harvard <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> History of Diving Museum. Close. <laughs> so um, Jay and Eric and uh, Diving with a Purpose were spent, gosh, we spent like a year putting that exhibit together. Um, so you guys are actually older than us because you've already had your 15 year anniversary? <laughs> yeah, just, just slightly. <laughs> just slightly. So I also see Keith Millian. Thank you very much. And Dave Hartman. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us, guys. Uh, Keith Milley, I've met him. Actually, I had the pleasure also of diving with Keith. Um, he's with FWC, and I think the first time I met you is when we dove the uh, with Carrie Dillon up in uh, Stewart. And uh, so thank you for joining us tonight. Keith's been around and is very familiar with uh, the Keys and uh, the museum and has helped on different things, so thank you. And who is that, John, that has our nice Fighting Octo shirt? Thank you. I am trying to figure out, it should be a lot, hey everyone, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. I have that, let's try, you should be able to now. We're have, I'm having some of the technical difficulties, so ah, Keith, there yeah. you go. <laughs> there it works, yeah, hi. <laughs> Hi, Lisa. And actually, uh, the photo behind me is from that very, uh, that dive that we did with Carrie Dillon. I think, I think John uh, Hazelbaker John was, was on, on. Uh -huh. too. So I think that's, that's me and, uh, and maybe Carrie kind of there at depth. That's probably a depth of 175. You guys were still up at the superstructure, but we dropped down to where the, the to the rudder over there. So that's the Mullifin located off of uh, Stewart, uh, Florida. Great dive for those of you um, who haven't been there. Really a fan, fantastic uh, dive. So Keith, have you had a chance over the years, did you meet Dr. Stroh or Sally at any of the functions here? No, unfortunately I don't get down to the Keys too often. I'm located in Tallahassee. And uh, you know, the few times I've been to the Keys over the years, it's been like after hours or something is always working. So the, my first time to the museum was only last summer um, for the, uh, after the 10 year anniversary of the Vandenberg, when you gave me that quick tour, uh, Lisa. Oh, got it. Driving, driving Well, down. and Keith was down, I think it was about a year ago when you helped us with the Lionfish tournament that was hosted in Key West. Yes. The so Lionfish, thank you for coming down for yeah. that. And 10, and 10 year Vandenberg. Uh, yep. Boy, yep. Time is uh, really flying by. And I, I know you all are, um, have initiatives for another large ship for the Middle Keys. And so I hope that comes to fruition. There's going to be a lot of legwork on that. So, uh, you know, I hope, I hope that becomes a reality as well. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have, do we know is Sally on yet? 
I am. In fact, my videos. Oh, on. there she is. She's oh, iPad there three. She is. Okay. <laughs> Our guest of honor. So you're and the one I'm we need to hear the from. Original. I want you to know <laughs> the original shirt that was at the very first seminar. So we want to know about the first seminar. Well, the first seminar was pretty exciting. Of course, it was about the um, timeline, the begin beginnings of the timeline and breath hold diving. But at the time that the seminar was promoted, uh, it, it was, of course, promoted in September for October. And a hurricane was charging down on the Keys. Um, just about the time of the storm and the and all of a sudden the non-residents were under mandatory evacuation and they all had to leave we had several we had some people from holland in that were helping us do the exhibits because we were doing the seminars concurrent with exhibits and um we had to got, get rid of all our house guests and the a faithful few, six people who were residents who hadn't evacuated yet, came to the lecture. So it was a, wasn't well attended because, well, everybody had left the keys, but it was uh, memorable, let's just say. Nice. Well, well yeah, it was exciting. And these shirts <laughs> well, that you see were... Uh, part of the of the promotion of the Immerse Yourself series, the 3,000 Years Under the Sea. And over the years, you and Dr. Joe, now the first year, did you all give each one of the talks as yes. the exhibits opened? Dr. Joe gave the exhibit. I worked, it was a slide projector in those days. I worked <laughs> the slide projector. And then at the end of the lecture, we gave a tour of the museum that was finished so far. So each month there was a talk about the history behind the new exhibit that we had just opened. So we hit, we had 12 exhibits and it took us a year, month by month to open them. And then we researched and, and you know, did the history, put together a PowerPoint on the, on the, history of that exhibit that we were presenting. So um, it, was, it was an interesting year. We were on a treadmill, but at least we knew where we were going. And I like that in the, um, the exhibit that we have now, the in-depth 15 years of the Diving Museum, that we have Miss Marie's first dime that was donated to the History of Diving Museum. Actually, the first donation Period. That's way right. before the museum. It was a sort of a twinkle in our eye and she made the first donation. Yeah. It was probably yeah. tithing for a little old lady on social security too, I might add. <laughs> uh, so Chris, do you have any, any hidden stories that you're not gonna share during your uh, presentation? I wrote a note down here about the promotional shirt and I laughed a little bit because when I first got to the museum, Sally gave us those shirts to work in. Uh, so in recent years, she now says that they're antiques and they belong in a museum and uh, preserve them. But uh, I, I thought that was funny. Uh, you know, now, now we look at these things differently. Uh, they, they were once things that, you know, we threw away and they become history in the long term, which is, I think, the story for a lot of historical diving apparatus. It's sort of one man's trash is another's treasure. I think there's an image of you, I hope that you will show tonight, um, and your brother working on the exhibits wearing those shirts. <laughs> I don't want to be give a spoiler alert, but we no. have some really great pictures from uh, days gone by. Excellent. 
So, so Sally, Dave Park I know you, Sally, I know you love all your museum exhibits, but do you have a favorite? Is there something in there that just really resonates with you? Oh, good question. Oh, probably Iron Mike, because he's the American uh, diving armor. He's really unique. He was functional in the in the twenties, um, and it's, he's so very unusual looking. We almost, in fact, in the early design of the museum, we almost put him on our on our sign out front. And um, in the exhibits, you'll see a little Mikey uh, doll that we were going to have made and sold in the little Mikey that's in the toy exhibit is um, my mom made that one for the sample and we tried to see if we could get some Chinese children to work on it but we're not able to to you know make contact with the with the um, mills overseas to get the shirts produced and then we use something else for our logo. Uh, <laughs> Daryl was here for his 10 year anniversary. Excellent. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Daryl Sporton. <laughs> I thought about wearing that. You dressed for the occasion. <laughs> and and brought a beverage. There you go. Right. So, Daryl, since, since we've got you uh, on here, why don't you tell us about your introduction to Doctors Joe and Sally or the museum? Oh, you know, I think before I moved down here, uh, I read about it and then I, uh, I stopped in to uh, see what was going on and went on a tour. And I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, along with, with reef.org and the Coral Restoration uh, Foundation, um, meeting Ken uh, Niedemeyer, uh, the the uh, uh, the all the information and the activities at the History of Diving Museum was another uh, another thing that drew me down here, I and mean, I, I moved down in 2013. Uh, I always thought that the room where we have the meetings and 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 the speakers looked like the room from when I saw the movie uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth, when all the scientists sat in that in that room with the mahogany cabinets and. You know, smoking cigars, even while well, we don't smoke cigars in there. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, it looked like like the Explorers Club or, you know, something like that. I thought it was really cool. And and, and it is very cool. And, you know, I'm sure we, we all love going to the seminars there. And unfortunately, we have to do it like this today, but that's okay. Anyway. Good to so, see Dr. You. Sally, how did you and Joe design these cabinets? Well, we didn't really design them. We used the, we had taken a trip to Germany to look for diving equipment. And while we were there, we went to Bayreuth because one of our favorite composers was Wagner. And we went to his museum and uh, his music room. And in his music room, he had cabinets that looked very much like our cabinets with locking cabinets with glass doors um, and you could walk around the music room and see the the old books that this great composer read and based a lot of his operas on and we thought what a great elegant design and we will use that for our research library so we came back with that image now, one thing we did do is start the bookshelves about 18 inches higher than Wagner had done, because after all, we are in a flood zone, and we thought that would protect some of the rare books to have it just a little bit higher. Um, and then uh, we sketched it out and showed the image to Tim Hemsoth, who was our exhibit designer, and he drew it to um, scale with, you know, made made the kind of drawings that you would use to actually create the, the, the cabinets. 
and we found some Amish in Michigan that we reached through a intermediary and the Amish made these cabinets out of uh, wood and treated them so that they wouldn't be exuding anything that would be harmful for the books. One of the young Amish people who had kind of gone to the other side drove them down and then Tim and I unloaded them and um, Tim and some volunteers installed them. So we thank uh, our love of classical music for the design of the research library. Oh, it's beautiful. We have uh, some other members on. Anybody want to raise their hand and uh, you got any stories about the early history of Divey Museum? I know some of you, uh, I see actually, who just joined us? Kurt just joined us with the Vandenberg in the background. And we have, um, I see Cynthia on. Cynthia was actually our August uh, speaker, um, talking about the, the book that she wrote about her dad, the first uh, explosive ordinance um, diver. <laughs> Lisa, I don't have an early memory, but I love that I am able to help do research him right now um, and sit in that beautiful library. And I, it's, still, it's an interesting project. I'm reading the Skin Diver magazines that somebody donated. And every once in a while, I'll leap out of my chair and run into the exhibit because I'm like, we have that. I know that. I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. And they had like the goggles from the, the Japanese women divers. The pearl divers. The yeah. pearl divers. They had the Parkland wetsuit top that's the mm -hmm. beautiful colors. Um, so it's been really, they have some of the um, ATM, one ATM suits. So it's been a really fun project. And I'm only in like the early 70s. And they're fighting about whether they should have C cards and environmental issues in the keys. So it's been a, a fabulous project. And I get to sit in the library and read them. And just one more shout out for how great the, the museum is. When I watched um, the documentary Enslaved, the first exhibit, or maybe it was a trailer, I'm watching it, I'm watching it, it's super exciting. And uh, Samuel Jackson's in the library and over his shoulder or my skin diver oh, yeah, magazine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like I was in the trailer. Like that's Samuel L. Jackson. She's like, no, no, that's there's my... a skin diver. Right? But it's Samuel L. Jackson. He's in the museum. <laughs> oh, so, that's great. That's so great. That's my yeah, museum. Nice. And that in Enslaved is a great, oh. great documentary series. I've been watching it. It's very well done. Um, we are really honored and thank DWP for bringing him here because of the interest, because of that exhibit. But that was that was another really good uh, good use of this absolutely beautiful facility. Thank you, Dr. Sally and Dr. Joe. So we actually, we've got a few minutes left and we can wrap up with some more stories, but to Dr. Sally, to Dr. Joe, if you have a beverage of your choice at your house, um, we want to thank you for all the dedication, all the travel, all the fun adventures that you and Dr. Joe had to get us where we are today. So cheers. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Dr. Cheers. Sally's and Dr. Love Joe, that. cheers to all of our volunteers, <laughs> our members, Sally. our people yeah. who have have helped us along the way, and we look forward to the next 15 years. Thank you, years. Yay. 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 Sally. Yay, Yay Dr. Sally. Joe. And I'm Hello, Dave and Hartman. And I'm toasting in a diving museum beer mug. I think they're available, <laughs> right? Oh. <laughs> yeah, how about that? That's pretty cool. My favorite <laughs> mug. <laughs> he, de he definitely represents. Great. So we have uh, Dave Hartman is on with us, and actually Dave has broadcast a couple um, of his programs, of his his travel show programs from the History of Diving Museum, and we did a behind the scenes tour, right, Dave? Yes, it was wonderful, except for that back corner of white water <laughs> issue. 
<laughs> we had a little connectivity issues in the back corner. Uh, hey, Emily, you should have warned us. Just you know, <laughs> woulda, coulda, shoulda. <laughs> woulda, coulda, shoulda. I've lived now in the Florida Keys for 16 years, so I've been here since the museum opened. And I was a very active scuba instructor when I first moved here. So I was actually at the museum at first year it opened. Not a lot, but Almorado seemed very far away when I first moved here. But I remember walking in there and being like, wow, this is very cool. And then seeing just the level of detail of things regarding diving, not even knowing some things related to diving, which is amazing. And, and Lisa mentioned something that an amazing use of space. And every time I go, I go in there, there is a more improved use of space and it's just phenomenal. And I would say the biggest improvement I've experienced in my 15 years was the hiring of Lisa Manji, oh. whatever, six years ago has been uh, amazing, amazing yeah. improvement I to the museum. I agree, I agree. The program <laughs> she's brought in, the level of, of use of the space again, the activity, the marketing, I mean, every single thing that she's been involved in. I know Lisa long before the museum has been absolutely wonderful. <laughs> Sally Mazar, great, great job bringing Lisa on board. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, um, I, and actually, I, I have to thank um, Scott Jones from Dive Newswire because oh, at that yeah. time I was living in Miami and I was writing for him. And he said, there's this great museum down in the Keys. It's not far from you. Go down there and cover their five year anniversary and do a story. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's, you know, an hour and a half up the street. So I came down for your five year anniversary, Dr. Sally, and, and met Dr. Sally. And she, I got here early because of traffic and things. And she took me on a, a little tour. And, um, you know, I just, I love what she and Dr. Joe had done. And the timing was right. I did a little bit of, not much, but some volunteering over the next um, five years. And, you know, as, as luck would have it and timing, graced us with the right time. I, I came on board right before their 10 year anniversary. So it's, yeah. it's been a nice couple of years. Yes. We love having you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers to Lisa. I, got, I finally got a glass now. Well, I appreciate all of, uh, of your comments and thank you very much, but uh, yeah, so it's a uh, it's a wonderful thing to be down here, and actually, I see Kurt Tid um, has joined us tonight. So while everybody's together and cheering, I'm going to thank you for being our sponsor this evening. He is a retired um, admiral, and actually was sponsoring us specifically in October because Happy Birthday Navy! Happy Birthday Navy! <laughs> Go Navy! Go Navy! So Go Navy! Um, yeah, so just some of the, the things that we have, uh, you know, going on. And um, I don't know if, oh, Dottie Mayo just joined us. Thank you. Dottie's uh, dad, Jacques Mayo. We have his sled that was actually added to our last core exhibit is the new free diving exhibit that, uh, that Tim Hemsoff had designed and put in. We got Jacques sled as well as Bob Crofts and some free diving information. So that was our, our last, or I should say our most recent core exhibit. So hi Dottie. Hi, hi. What's it nice like to, to how are things over by you? Um, it's getting busy. The uh, real snowbirds like cattle egrets are coming back. I've seen swallows, wood storks, and lots of and then we are getting snowbirds from the Midwest coming down as well. People snowbirds. So you're over on the west coast of Florida. Yes. So uh, Dottie, how did you meet Drs. Joe and Dr. Sally? Uh, through John, Hasselbe John Has Hasselbaker. There he is. <laughs> I just signed on. Um, so he picked up the sled and... Um, uh, I was introduced to Sally when we had the ribbon, not the ribbon cutting, the opening ceremony for the exhibit. Mm -hmm. So it's, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> no. Sounds like we have a puppy in the house. <laughs> <laughs> 
someplace. <laughs> Um, and where do we have Dr. Sally? Um, I've got her. She's she's off camera right now. Oh, there okay. she is. She's back. <laughs> well, Sally, before we turn over and we're going to transition in a minute to our immerse yourself, I thought I would uh, see if you had any any thing that you would like to add to our, our wonderful uh, social celebration. No, I thank everyone for coming to help us celebrate this milestone, and I'm looking forward to the talk. So how did you meet the Duttons? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that one afternoon, Tim Hemsoth phoned me and said, I have two well-spoken, clean-cut, well-dressed young men here at the museum who are looking for a summer job. I think we should hire them both. <laughs> and we immediately did. And the rest is history that Chris will tell you about. But you're, you, you have since met the, and kind of engulfed the whole family. Yes, and I knew, um, of course, uh, Kathy was on our board, the, mm -hmm. his, his mom. And his dad it, it, and has been a, a good friend of the museum and a donor to our research library. The Duttons have been to their firm. So they've been good friends for a long time and good museum stewards. Nice. All right, Chris, anything to wrap up before we... Uh transition over to your presentation in a few minutes? I think I'm ready to go, if you guys are. All right, uh, I'll kind of open it up. Anybody else who's with us, raise your hand. <laughs> I'm gonna take a PS. What? I said I'm gonna take a PS. No, they can't see us, you see. If so you... who is, to, tell who us is who's they? talking. It sounds like Greg, but. Well, maybe they hear us. <laughs> I can hear somebody Is that, is that the Bertucci's? Yes, yes, that's Andy and Renee. Can okay. You hear? Oh, we can hear you. We can hear you. We can't see you. Well, there's a reason. Oh, oh, no, we can't hear them. <laughs> they just muted themselves. <laughs> All right. We, okay. Uh, okay. Well, I think, um, it's seven o'clock, so I don't know, Emily, you can work your magic to uh, do what we need to do to transition for Immerse Yourself. Okay, so. Um, for a second now, so we're back. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, so what we're, thank you, Kurt. I see your chat message. Um, <laughs> so um, what we're gonna do for the transitioning now to more your typical Immerse Yourself, I am going to go back to muting everyone if you have control um, or know how to turn off your camera, that would be great if you can do that. Otherwise, I will do it for you and it's nothing personal. So don't worry about that. Um, and and okay. if anyone does have any questions um, during the course of the presentation, you can send them to me via the chat. Um, I have it set up that um, everyone's messages will just come to me and at the end of the presentation, I will field them to Chris and it just kind of helps with keeping everything streamlined and going from there. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to mute everyone for a quick second. And that includes you, Lisa and Chris. So let me unmute you for a moment. It's an all or nothing kind of thing. And okay, so I should have asked. Yep. Everybody. Cool. So Chris, you should be able to, oh, there we go. You should be unmuted as well at the moment. Um, Lisa, do you want to do any, like the more mm -hmm. typical intro? Okay. So yep. what I'm about to do is give you the screen. And give me one second and we'll start from there. Okay. You're good to go, Lisa. 
All right. Um, hello, everybody. Lisa from the History of Diving Museum. I'm the executive director. Welcome to our 15 year anniversary. Uh, we just had a little half an hour social, getting some finding out and talking to some different people who have been in, involved with the museum for quite a while. And uh, just to let you know some of the other things that are going on. If you don't get our email or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, uh, some of the things that we have coming up are a virtual costume contest. And you can send in your entries, family friendly. We've got a couple different categories for adults, kids, and even pets. So if you have your favorite little fur animal that you want to dress up in some kind of ocean theme idea, um, snap a picture and get it to us, uh, either emailing it to programs or putting it up on Facebook and tagging us and, um, or reach out to us and we'll shoot you an email with all the instructions. So be part of our virtual costume contest. If you come down to the Keys, we invite you to come in and see our 15 years of the Diving Museum featured exhibit. It'll be on display until December 31st, and then we will be changing out into Art of the Abyss starting in January. Other fun things that are happening, uh, we're greatly appreciate all of our members that are on tonight. And we invite you, if you're not a member, if you've been following us and kind of on the fence or on the rail of a boat, and deciding we, uh, we encourage you to become members and help support educational outreach and uh, fun programs like this. Next month on the third Wednesday of the month, which the Immerse Yourself program has been going on since 2005 on the third Wednesday of the month. It started the first year with Drs. Joe and Sally and um, after all the exhibits were built out and they continued to, to give presentations, but we also have speakers from around the world. And actually with Zoom, we have even more of an opportunity to bring people in from different parts to talk about the ocean and authors and history and military and, and all different kinds of uh, topics. Next month, we're gonna have Kylie Smith from iCare and talking about some of the iconic reefs and some of the proactive reef restorations that are going to be going on in our local Isla Morada area. But uh, tonight, tonight we have Chris Dutton. And I met Chris years ago. He was, as Dr. Sally had mentioned, he and his brother came knocking on the door one day looking for a summer job. And little did he know, I'm not sure how many years later, not only is he a valuable member, he's uh, our board chair, his family is totally immersed in the museums, they're supporters of the library and just have helped out on a variety of things over the years. So um, Chris, I thoroughly enjoy your stories and your history and really look forward to what you'll be uh, going over tonight. So. Chris Dutton, he's also an attorney up in the uh, Tampa Clearwater area with Dutton Law Group. So thank you for tonight's um, sponsor, Admiral K retired Admiral Kurt did. He and his family are members and are celebrating October for the uh, birthday of the uh, Navy. So thank you for being our sponsors and uh, Emily, we'll, we'll hand it off to you in our presentation. Okay, so we'll get started here. Uh, so I'm doing this presentation on the 15 year history of uh, the History of Diving Museum. And I am the, the chairman of the board of directors. Uh, I'm an attorney from Tampa, Florida. And I, and I also wanted to say welcome to everybody. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here to uh, support me and watch my presentation and also to uh, toast to the museum. Uh, the museum is something that has really meant a lot to me in my life. Uh, I spent a lot of time working on uh, my duties as chairman of the board of directors. Um, I, I'm not always necessarily uh, entrenched as perhaps somebody like John Hazelbaker with the history um, because he has such a depth of knowledge, but I'm very much in the trenches trying to make sure that um, the, the museum continues on and it will continue on until um, in perpetuity, um, you know, for generations to come. And that's really what's important to me about being 
uh, part of the museum and on the board of directors is um, I think that this is a community oriented museum. Uh, I think Sally has um, really been somebody that, that focuses on helping other nonprofits in the community. Um, so this is a place that uh, everybody can come and, and feels accepted and welcome. And uh, it's, it's been my honor to uh, sit on the board of directors. I also want to thank my, my uh, fellow uh, uh, people on the board of directors, John Hazel Baker, Kristen Misso, uh, Barb Draves, uh, Patty Gross, Bob Mur Murray, and Mary Eileen Vitale. And most of all, um, I want to thank uh, Sally Bauer and uh, Lisa Mangilia, our great executive director. So my favorite uh, diving, museum, uh, diving movie is The Life Aquatic uh, with Steve Zissou, uh, who is played by Bill Murray. And uh, he's, if you haven't seen the movie, you, you really should, and you really should see it twice because Bill Murray is a very uh, interesting char character and he may not come across as an inspiring individual the first time you see it, but um, there's a lot that goes on in the movie where he reaches a lot of highs and then reaches a lot of lows and then and then comes back up at the end of the movie and, and reaches those highs again. And, and uh, my favorite quote from the movie is, um, this is an adventure. And that to me really is symbolic of the museum where it's, it's a story that really has it all. It has a uh, story of Sally and Dr. Joe's dream, um, collecting this equipment and creating a museum to house it and uh, create an, an educational center. And it's, it's a story of, uh, you know, love and passion. It has, a, it's a story with a tragic side to it, but it's a story of resilience and uh, which is a story that continues on to today. Okay. We're gonna we're having a technical update, so um, there we go. Is this it? <laughs> can I can I butt in a second? Oh. Who yes. is who's button in? <laughs> Dotty Mayall, I apologize, but I'm not really familiar with the Zoom, and there's a little red button in my corner that says recording. Does that mean it's recording Chris's lecture? Yes, correct. Oh, well, I don't need to have it recorded. So should I click on it? Um, that you can, it's recording on our end because we share it onto YouTube for people who aren't able to watch it. Oh, okay. I'll leave it as it is. Yeah. <laughs> you. so you're fine, Dottie. Don't worry. <laughs> Continue on. <laughs> Emily, does the screen share seem to be working? It should be, I have it on that. So what I want you to do, Chris, is hit the, if, if you put your mouse towards the bottom of your Zoom screen, it should pop, there should be a green um, arrow button that says share screen under it. You should be able to click on that. Do you see it? I do not. Okay, you know what my guess is you are not inside Zoom, so you might have to open up Zoom. Just click it. Oh. Um, what, what are you guys seeing? It says start Zoom is asking to join a meeting, but he's already joined. Okay. Um, so hmm. minimize. Maybe, Maybe it's this. <laughs> Oh, you should, you should. Oh, okay. We got it. Thank you. Okay. And then once, so you'll hit that share screen button and then a window should, there we go. Okay. So in other words, have folks not seen the, the slide so far? No, nobody has. So if you can go back to your first one. Okay. So that's a picture of Bill Murray from uh, the Life Aquatic. So I, I, ha I found this, uh, uh, definition of historiography, which in some ways I think of it as the history of the history, which is sort of what I'm telling tonight. And uh, I found this from Britannica, which historiography is the writing of history, especially the writing of history based on the critical examination of sources, the selection of particular details from the authentic materials in those sources, 
in the synth synthesis of those details into a narrative. Um, so I think tonight we're, you know, I'm going to be telling the history of, of how it came to be over the last, um, although 15 years of the museum being open in the last um, 60 years of um, Sally and Joe's collecting uh, historical diving equipment. Um, so this is also sort of an outline for the presentation, as I call it, two histories. And it's really, I split it up in two ways. There's the history before the opening of the museum and then the, the history after the museum. And uh, I, I'm gonna tell a little bit about my history uh, at the museum. Uh, so I'm a scuba diver. I was scuba certified in 1999 with Patty. Uh, I'm also a dive control specialist in Nitrox certified with SSI. Um, I also completed my uh, dive master course, but did not turn in my paperwork timely to SSI. Um, if anybody knows anybody from SSI to uh, make that happen, that'd be great. Uh, I come from a, a diving household, and this is a picture of uh, my dad from the, the 1970s, and he was uh, a diving instructor uh, for the YMCA. And uh, I actually, before I got certified, my dad threw us in the pool, me and my brother, when we were five and six years old with a, a regulator and uh, um, taught us how to scuba dive. So uh, I included the, the picture of John Wayne throwing the, the, the child into the water, um, whether he wanted to go in or not. Although I would say we went in more willingly than uh, in that scene. Uh, I was a history major at Auburn University. And during my time studying history, I specifically chose to write on topics involving diving history. And I took an interest in diving technology. So this is where my story really begins at the museum. And it's in the summer of 2007. And I wanna add a little context to this story. Um, 2007 was kind of a different time uh, in the Keys. It, it was really the start of the recession. And um, it was, there were a lot of places that were looking, that, that were empty, um, businesses that were closing. Uh, it was just, it was kind of a quiet place in the Keys. and. Uh, it, it was very different than it is today. It was a different time than, than you know, the age of social media. I know everybody remembers these times, but it, it was just, in particular, a very different time in the Keys to, to live down here. But it was, it was a neat time. And the way I sort of describe it, it, it was, I think, the old Keys, the way that, that the Keys sort of used to be um, before everybody tore out Royal Poinciana's and put in you know, Christmas tree palms. Uh, it was just a really, really neat time to, to be down and down in the Keys. Uh, I had, a, I was fortunate, uh, my family has a house in the Keys. I had a grandfather who was, uh, worked for Eastern Airlines and owned a house here. And he passed away when I was in high school. And I had this opportunity, you know, my parents allowed us to, my brother and I, to move down to the Keys and uh, hopefully find jobs, uh, which turned out to be more difficult than, than we imagined. So I also want to add, I'm going to throw in a few tidbits about other local keys, uh, factoids and history, um, because I, I think that, again, as Sally has had an orientation about other businesses in the keys and helping them and, and being a friend to other nonprofits, um, I think it's important just to remember other histories as well. Um, and this story takes us to Papa Joe's, which was a um, well-known watering hole in Upper Matacumbe across from Bud and Mary's. And um, before there were many of the businesses in the Keys, uh, Papa Joe's was there and it was um, 75 years old, had been there for 75 years at the time it closed. Uh, and I don't remember exactly how my brother and I ended up there with a car, but we had some car trouble and we had to call AAA and as we were waiting for uh, AAA to come, we took a drive. Um, I also want to add, there's a great video on YouTube about Papa Joe's, and it talks about all the hurricanes that it survived, but what it couldn't survive was the, uh, the economy. 
So as fate would have it, uh, my brother and I took a drive and we drove past the History Diving Museum. And this picture sort of depicted it as best I, I could of how I remember first driving by the, the museum. It wasn't the first time, but I had been by the museum a number of times, but for some reason, I, I just, I knew it was there, but I, I just didn't notice it. Um, and this, this picture kind of looks a little dark and I just, I just remember it that way. And I, I caught it in the corner of my eye and I, I looked to my brother Clay and I said, why don't, we, why don't we stop in there and see if you know, they're hiring? And we had probably put in applications all up and down the keys and everybody said, unfortunately, you know, we're not hiring. And uh, my brother said, you know, I think the answer is gonna be the same, you know, but let's give it a shot. So as fate would have it, we stopped in the museum. And uh, I wanna add also uh, a big part of the story of the museum is uh, the people. And you know, from, from the moment we walked into the museum, um, even before, and this is, this is Tim Hemsoff, um, for those who do know him or may not know him, um, he was labeled as the curator for a period of time of the museum. Um, but even before meeting Tim, we walked in and we met um, a, a very kind uh, lady at the desk and her at the front desk. Her name was Bev. And, um, you know, it's people stories like hers that I, I think it lost in time. And I, I'm not sure um, how she came about um, working at the museum, but um, she was just a very uh, nice person. Uh, she was very much about her church and she was a friend to everybody and even before we met Tim uh, she we asked her if, if you know the museum was hiring and she was the first person that was enthusiastic about um, hiring us and I'm not sure what happened or where Bev is um, but you know I hope that she is well wherever she is so Tim uh, who's in the picture here came out and met met my brother and I and uh, it, it, it was a I think Sally, before the, the presentation started, put it correctly. Um, he came out and said something to the, to the degree of, you know, two college, you know, uh, students, uh, you know, we were, we're both pretty big guys. We, we both played high school football and um, worked out and, you know, people who had strong backs to, to work around the museum. Uh, he thought that we would be, you know, a good addition to the team and, he was really the one responsible for bringing us on um, at the museum. So I'm very grateful uh, to Tim and he's a, a dear, dear friend. Um, and I'll, I'll add a little bit more about Tim. We used to call him Mr. Miyagi. Uh, he would always wear a white headband and uh, a yellow shirt. And the shirt always was clean. And we came to find out that there was a stack of, of yellow shirts behind uh, the seat in the cab of his truck. And, uh, you know, it, it was just the stories like this that, that really made the museum a, an interesting and neat place to work, um, you know, back in 2007. Um, and it, it was just a, a very different place. For instance, the museum shop had nothing in it. Um, we literally did not sell any items. Uh, you would buy admission and you would go into the museum and that was it. Uh, I think a good day for us selling admission was about maybe 12 people coming through the museum. So when we, when we first got here, it was, it was really just trying to get going um, during a bad economy. And, uh, but somebody believed in us. And I, I do wonder if that would have been my brother's, my last summer in the Keys, if Tim hadn't, you know, helped us become employed. So this is my uh, two of my oldest photos that I think I have from the museum. I know this one on the left, um, this is Karen Ann Gilbert uh, in the center, and then my brother Clay Dutton. Uh, I know that was from 2008, uh, so that was our second summer at, at the museum. Um, but I believe that that picture on the right is the first picture that we had from 2007. And the first task that they had my brother and I do at the museum was uh, the research library was a storage facility when we got here. And our first 
our first thing they wanted us to do was tear down the walls of the of the storage units to prepare it to someday become the research library. And what they told us was that task was gonna take us the rest of the summer. In fact, we may not even complete it. Um, we finished tearing down the walls of that before noon that very first day that we worked at the museum. So these are some pictures of the research library being built. Um, Obviously, we have uh, the shelves installed and books on the walls, but um, as Sally said, it was the people and the volunteers that came in and, and really put it all together. But um, I like to think that my brother and I had a hand in, in clearing out the space and, and in order to make it what it is today. So doctors, uh, Joe and Sally Bauer, um, I, know, I know that some of you um, know them well and know their story well, but for others of you that don't, uh, they need some introduction here because the, the stories sort of intersect where I'm gonna conclude about my history at the museum um, and introduce them. But uh, on the right, that's obviously uh, Dr. Joe Bauer and this is Sally and they, they founded the museum and collected all the artifacts um, here. So, Sadly, Dr. Joe Bauer passed away in April, on April 3rd, 2007. And um, it, was, it, it was a hard time, I think, for the entire museum and all associated. And um, I, I, know, I know Sally still has a hard time, but what we didn't know when my brother and I came to the museum is um, we came in the summer of 2007, only two or three months after his passing. And I think that we came at an important time to become, be a friend to Sally and, and she was a friend to us during a, um, a developmental time in, in my brother's and my life where we were in college. And uh, I didn't even really know until I was preparing for this, this presentation how close in time they were because I just felt, always felt that Sally was such a joyful person and, and uh, Again, importantly, I, I, I hope that I had some hand in maybe helping her through, through a difficult time. And, and uh, I think that that's in large part why our friendship runs so deep even to today. So again, you know, we, we just became really close friends and we spent a lot of time with Sally. Um, we would come to her house. Um, we, we would basically do anything that we could for Sally and, and, and vice versa. Um, you know, I think this was, uh, I think the Sunsplash event or the Silver Bar event, and I believe this was from the first summer, but uh, we, we just sort of became like family. She, she would come over for dinner from time to time and, and vice versa, and uh, just uh, it was really uh, the formation of a really close friendship. Um, again, I'm, I'm adding some tidbits about, you know, other keys history, but um, my brother, uh, you know, I went on to obviously become, like I mentioned, a lawyer. Um, my brother is a, a veterinarian, and I think that he would credit in large part Sally for helping him to uh, achieve his goal, or, or I, would, I would probably say realize his dream. Um, and my brother always had an interest in, in animals, and, and for anyone who knows about veterinary schools, it's, it's very difficult. Um, to get in, it's very competitive. And I believe there's only 30 something vet schools in the United States. And um, Sally recommended, talked to my brother Clay and, and he said, you know, I have an interest in animals. And Sally said, well, you need to go work with Laura Quinn at the Wild Bird Sanctuary. And uh, that's a picture of Laura Quinn on the left. And uh, again, it, it was just different times in the Keys. and you know, they were doing surgeries on birds that, you know, my brother was doing that right away and, and he learned how to, you know, cut his teeth doing, you know, learning these things. And um, I remember Sally teaching, my brother had a suture in the, in the front yard, um, cutting uh, a pool noodle down the center and uh, stitching it together. So I just think that, um, you know, I'm very thankful for Sally, and, and these were the sorts of things that, that she did in the community. You know, she was a friend of Laura Quinn, and who has uh, now passed, but they, 
they celebrate her um, at the Wild Bird Sanctuary and her name is there on the sign. Um, I became very close friends with Sally's mother, Ms. Marie. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't exclude her from this, uh, this history. Um, Ms. Marie was my best friend and, and I was her best friend. And uh, you know, it did, didn't matter how, how old or how different we were, but um, here I am putting a, a diving helmet on Ms. Marie and uh, when she was 94 years old in Sally's swimming pool. And here's just some pictures from over the years uh, of myself at the museum uh, at various points in time. Um, some are just fun pictures. Uh, the bottom left is the, the four year anniversary of the museum. Um, and that's Tim holding up a, a four sign. Uh, on the right in the in the blue shirt, the royal blue shirt is my, my friend Javier Soto. Uh, he worked at the museum and uh, is still one of my dear friends to today. He was um, a groomsman in, in my wedding. That's a picture of him when he uh, translated the uh, museum guide into Spanish and uh, he was in the newspaper. Um, that's my brother Clay on the left with uh, <laughs> probably a very precious artifact, but uh, we, we were just having a good time. And uh, that, that was sort of the story here. We, we always had fun and it, it has just always been a, a great group to work with and a pleasure. So now I'm gonna tr transition to more of the, the history of the museum and, and stop talking about myself here. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm gonna start with the history before the opening of the museum. And, and this is sort of my outline here. Who are the museum co-founders, Dr. Sally and Joe Bauer? And then I'm gonna go into a timeline which talks about the 1960s and their, their first helmet, uh, the 1970s through the 90s, which was a period of collecting, studying, and planning. And then the early 2000s when they decided to open the museum. So this was from a previous presentation where um, Sally described Dr. Joe Bauer as a visionary, um, and she described herself as an implementer. And shortly before uh, I started, or before this presentation started, I saw a placard on the wall here um, with a quote from Sally, where she, she talked about this, this very relationship. And this is what Sally said. As with every couple who works together, we each had our own unique strengths. In a nutshell, Joe was the visionary and I was the implementer. He would have the idea and I would work out the details to make it happen. I think that they had a, a beautiful relationship and I think the um, museum is testament to um, that relationship. So a little history uh, about the, the Bowers outside of um, uh, their um, the diving and their collecting. Uh, so Dr. Joe Bauer was a surgeon um, in Cleveland, and uh, he, he was actually a pretty, pretty famous surgeon. Uh, he was one of the first physicians in uh, the United States to study uh, laparoscopic surgery. He was one of the first that went overseas to study it, and then he actually coined the term keyhole surgery. Um, he was a Renaissance man of, of sorts. Um, he spoke a number of languages. Um, I didn't, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, I did not get a chance to meet uh, Dr. Joe, but I, I understand that this was um, somebody that was very determined um, and had uh, goals in mind and was, was going to reach them. And uh, Sally, um, again, I think the, the implementer, um, uh, reference is, is appropriate and um, I think that she um, was just a, a very, um, Sally's a very kind person and I think as, as um, driven as Joe was, I think that she was there to perhaps be the um, sort of good cop, bad cop is maybe what I'm trying to describe and uh, Sally was an ER physician and um, she was always there to help people. Even even recently, um, you know, she 
she gave me a tetanus shot at her house when I was, you know, a young intern, you know, 13 years ago. Uh, she's just always there to help people. She's still involved in medicine in, in this Keys community. Um, so they had this really kind of unique dynamic um, where Dr. Joe was a surgeon and, and Sally was an ER physician, uh, both in Cleveland. And uh, Dr. Dr. Sally and Joe Bauer, they were both divers. Um, I, I'm not sure when uh, Sally said they started diving, but um, certainly as far back as the 60s and maybe the 50s. Um, they were very interested in marine biology. And um, they actually were uh, responsible for um, uh, basically raising certain um, types of fish in the Caymans. Uh, and I believe that's one of the articles on the right about uh, raising those fish in the Caymans. So their collection started out um, innocently enough with one helmet, um, which was, uh, I believe it was a C.B. Gorman. And the story went that uh, Dr. Joe and Sal Sally were down in the Florida Keys diving, um, which is where they would, they would often come and they have a, a rich history in this, this Keys community. And there was a store that they had heard about that was sort of an antiquarian store. And they went, um, it was in Miami, they went to the store before they, they got on their flight to uh, back to go home. And they had this helmet there and they thought it was just a beautiful helmet and something really beautiful to take home with them. Uh, and they paid $500 for the helmet. And I, I asked Sally, um, was that expensive back then? And she said, yes, it was uh, very expensive, but they, they thought it was just so neat. And um, their, their basically love for collecting, um, as she, decide, as she uh, described it, the collecting bug bit us with just one helmet. And, uh, it really just went from there. I also asked Sally how long it took for um, them to really ramp up starting to buy other equipment after that first helmet. Was it a year, two years, five years? And she said it was almost immediate. Um, there, was, there was no wasting time. They, they were just hooked and they were going to, going to search for this equipment wherever they could find it. Um, so they became pretty much known for um, you know, being associated with diving. And, you know, this really became a part of them. Uh, that picture on the bottom right is Joe uh, at the groundbreaking, I believe, of their, their surgery clinic. And, you know, he has a, a helmet on there. So everywhere he went, this, this was very much a part of, of Dr. Joe. So their, their collection kept growing. Um, and I, I'm not sure where this picture is, but, uh, a lot of this equipment was stored in their, their home. Uh, and even if you go to Sally's home today, it is, it is very much like its own museum. Uh, so it's, it's very neat. And apparently the collection that is in the museum is only one third of their, their total collection. So again, the, the Bowers set out to basically, you know, not just collect, but learn the history of these things. And, and preserve it. And I asked Sally, you know, back when they first started collecting, how did they go about doing that? And, you know, in an age of no internet to, to contact people, um, how, did you, how did you find this equipment? She said that they would go to places with water. They would go to places where they knew that, that diving happened and there was a history. And then they would go there and they would ask questions. They would go to antique stores. And then the, somebody in the antique store would point them in the direction of somebody else. Um, and this was at the beginning before they really became known for um, diving history. So after a while, I think that the Bowers became contacted when um, an interesting piece of history uh, came up for them. And then I think that made that a lot easier. So they spent about 40 years collecting. And, and I also want to add one more thing about this picture. Um, on the bottom right there is uh, Iron Duke, and that is one of the one atmosphere suits. And I think the fact that, um, and you see a young Joe Bauer there, and I talked about the, um, uh, the collecting bug biting them. Uh, the fact that they were buying what at, one atmosphere suits 
right after uh, basically buying their first helmet, um, I think goes to show their level of um, interest in this history. So, um, you know, Joe is very, very young there. I imagine he's around my age. Um, you know, I'm 33 and um, he's a young man there and uh, looked like he was collecting for a long time. So a part of that process was also restoration and cleaning. Um, and they, they rebuilt a lot of this equipment and learned how it worked. Um, that, that globe on the right is in our breath hold exhibit. And that is, um, if, if anybody has seen it, it is actually cracked and it has been put back together. And that's a picture of Joe um, putting every piece back together like a puzzle. Uh, they also started being published. Um, Joe and Sally uh, have, uh, are in the pictorial history of diving and they actually wrote the chapter on diving helmets. And that is their, that is their um, chapter on the right. And they had a lot of fun um, with diving history and they, and they learned a lot along the way. Um, you know, and these are both open bottom helmets here, um, which we'll get more into later on in the presentation, but uh, these helmets were much better for um, the warm waters of Florida. Uh, there's even one made out of wood because you wouldn't have to put on a whole suit. Uh, it made it much better to dive in uh, these warm waters. So the Bowers, um, one, of, one of their big contributions was they started the Historical uh, Diving Society uh, in 1992. Uh, I believe it started as the International Historical Diving Society, and it later became the Historical Diving Society, which, um, you know, these are groups that have taken on a life of their own, um, even though um, Sally is, is perhaps less active uh, these days than she perhaps was. So, and they, they did all this while they were working full-time jobs. And uh, again, uh, they were both very accomplished in, in their careers. And uh, there's Dr. Joe working on the, the bottom left. Uh, this is a picture of, of Dr. Joe when he, um, when they first acquired Iron Duke, the one atmosphere suit. And uh, there, there's actually a long story that goes with, with acquiring this. And I, I don't think I could totally tell it, but, uh, in the way that Sally could, but I think that the, it had to go with, there were some issues in customs, uh, getting this suit, and then um, it was so large that they, they could hardly get it to their house. And this is uh, Dr. Joe uh, single-handedly hoisting this, um, this one atmosphere suit, which weighs thousands of pounds um, with basically, you know, just a, a winch. And uh, as Sally has said, you know, he was probably a pyramid builder in a, a, a previous life. This is that one atmosphere suit, um, Iron Duke. This was um, before it was uh, restored and this is after and uh, it is currently in our abyss exhibit. This is in, this is a, um, the BBC uh, was doing a piece on the Cenotes, uh, which had an underwater, um, I guess civilization. Uh, civilization was there at one time, and or allegedly, and they they wanted to access that that underwater um, place, and they contacted the Bowers as uh, basically experts on diving equipment, and they asked the Bowers if they could use some of their equipment, and the Bowers traveled um, to Mexico with their equipment and uh, helped helped the BBC um, basically put on this production. That was the actor uh, who acted in the production. And then this is uh, a donkey with two, um, two of their diving helmets strapped to its back. So again, um, as Sally describes it, they were totally addicted. Um, I believe this is their house in Cleveland. I could be wrong, but my understanding is, and I haven't been to Sally's house in Cleveland, um, but there is, my understanding is there is just diving equipment everywhere. Uh, and it is uh, like a museum in and of itself. Um, on the bottom here, these are two um, more modern open bottom helmets uh, for recreation. And uh, 
there's interesting stories that go along with every one of these. Um, for instance, the white helmet there is the Sea Walker. It was a Chinese helmet. And uh, Sally said that they went to Dima and uh, the, uh, the person who was there um, for Sea Walker uh, asked if they would trade a knife for that helmet, which they did. And um, I believe that Sea Walker helmet is still on display at the museum. So the Bowers, again, their, their house, uh, you know, started to not have enough room for all of this equipment. And uh, what they, they realized is there, there really wasn't a place to tell the, the history of diving. So, and, and as Sally described, she said that they went to what was somewhat of a museum. I believe it might have been in, in Panama City or, or somewhere, maybe St. Augustine. And uh, somebody had their helmets and uh, displayed to the public and they were just wrapped around all the side of the room. And that was it, it didn't really tell the story. It was more just an, an ex exhibition um, so that you could come see these helmets and, and you know say, oh, these are neat, but it really didn't do much more than that. And uh, so this, at the time, uh, as the 90s sort of rolled around, there was so much equipment, it really was time to think of, of what to do with all this. And again, as, as, the, uh, as the collection grew, the house seemed to get smaller. And, and you can see that's, um, you know, living space in the Bowers home that's completely filled with uh, um, entire Jake suits. So they accumulated what became one of the largest uh, collections in the world, perhaps the largest collection. And uh, these are some pictures of um, their collection, you know, helmets just everywhere. And, they needed something to do with it and they wanted to share it with others. So they felt that a museum was needed to tell the story. They made a booklet uh, to basically advertise and, and help to um, find somebody to, to tell their story. And they started to reach, around, uh, reach out and see if um, various museums and other entities had any interest in um, helping them build a museum. They, they went to the Cleveland Science Museum. They, they went to Epcot and had a meeting with uh, the people at Disney. Um, they went to Tarpon Springs. Uh, and this museum actually, from what I understand, came very close to being in Tarpon Springs. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Tarpon Springs, that, um, that's, that's where the Greeks settled. And uh, they um, harvest uh, sponges out of Tarpon Springs. and uh, I live in Clearwater, which is, is near Tarpon Springs. And uh, if you go there to, today, it still is very much a, a, a diving town, which is, is really interesting. Um, and they also went to Grand Cayman, where um, I think the Bowers would describe as um, perhaps their second, maybe their, their third home, a place that they, they love and, um, and uh, went, went uh, a number of times. I think they also considered whether the Florida Keys were the proper place to, to have this museum. Um, and I think that they gave a lot of time and thought about um, where, the, where the proper place was because this is really an international history. So the Bowers eventually settled upon the Keys um, and it was for a number of reasons, which, which I'll get to later in the presentation. Um, and finding no adequate suitor to help them uh, um, open a museum. They owned a house in the Keys by that time and, and were, I believe, living here full time. So they looked at, I believe, both Key West and Isla Mirada, and they uh, spoke to somebody, um, I believe that was from down in Key West and, and was involved in these sort of things. And uh, that person said, you must do it in Key West. and and. Uh, they disagreed <laughs> and uh, ended up opening their uh, museum here in Isla Mirada. And these are pictures of uh, Joe and Sally out front of their house with uh, some historic artifacts here in the Keys. And this is an article from 2003 that was in the newspaper where uh, announcing that they created a nonprofit and uh, we're starting to prepare to open a museum. Uh, this is from their, their opening year. And again, this is um, 15 years to this month, um, October 19th, 2005. Um, 
when they were finally opening their doors. This was the first donation, um, and this was one of the arms from one of the One Atmosphere suits, um, Iron Mike, which Sally says is one of her favorite artifacts. Um, this was really a, an apparatus that was ahead of its time. It was very unique and, and uh, it, was, it was a well-built machine and you can see um, the way the claw works. And um, so I believe they deliberately chose to uh, um, use Iron Mike to um, collect the first donation. So this was the announcement and uh, as the, the walls um, sort of went up on the, the storage unit here, which um, for those of you who couldn't tell or didn't know, this, this was once um, a, a storage unit. And uh, these are some of the pictures as the, the process started to um, take place of converting an old storage facility into the History Diving Museum. Here's some of the pictures of uh, tearing down walls. And uh, here is Dr. Joe driving his tractor uh, across a bridge in the Keys to uh, head from their house to the museum. Here's some pictures of uh, the interior of the museum and, and walls going up, um, which now comprises uh, the vault um, that you walk through the museum. This is one of the original sketches of the museum. Um, and this goes to show just how forward thinking Dr. Joe was. And uh, what is unique about this sketch is uh, the museum has never really been reconfigured. Um, we've added things, but we, we haven't really changed from this vision. Um, it, it was a natural sort of progression through the museum where you go through a, an initial timeline history. Um, then you go through the open bottom helmet section for the South Florida diving. Um, and, and I'll get to some of these exhibits later on in the presentation, but uh, it, this was a very well thought out museum um, for a number of years by the Bowers before uh, the doors ever opened. That was the initial drawing and the initial drawing um, turned into um, more planned out sketches. And below is our exhibit map that we use today. This is, I would describe as the marquee exhibit at the museum. Um, this is the Parade of Nations and every country that made a helmet is represented on the Parade of Nations. And I think that when I first became associated with the museum, this is really what got me hooked where I, I felt like this was um, a museum that I would, I would have um, some relationship with for the rest of my life. I, I just could not believe that this exhibit. Um, and I think that this is maybe um, the most thought out exhibit perhaps of, of all of them that uh, the Bowers knew that this was going to be um, just a, a spotlight exhibit for the museum. And, and for those of you who haven't been in the museum, um, I think that you, you will have a similar experience if you see this, uh, this exhibit. It, it is really something uh, special. So again, here's some more of the timeline exhibit sketches. Uh, there were the bigger sketches and then um, smaller sketches to define the individual spaces. Uh, they started promoting the museum throughout the Keys and this is um, Dr. Joe and Sally and uh, Ms. Murray. So the next thing was um, creating the exterior of the museum and uh, making it um, feel like you were in, in a actual diving museum before you even stepped foot through the doors. And uh, there were two very famous artists, uh, some of you may have heard of before, uh, David Dunleavy and Guy Harvey, who painted the uh, mural on the outside of the museum. This is an important picture, and this was shortly after the uh, murals were completed. And uh, if you'll notice, and, and you may think to yourself, why is there only one diver on the side of the building? And uh, I believe at the time, uh, the, there was only so much advertisement that could be allowed on the side of your building. Um, and we were allowed one diver on the side, which was um, the Bowers decided on um, Art McKee, who's a, a very, perhaps the most famous Florida Keys diver 
um, certainly the most famous uh, diver to Isla Mirada. And uh, he has an interesting story in history, um, which is on display at the museum. So again, Art McKee, uh, the fa who they consider the father of modern treasure diving, um, seen riding um, this anchor where he would be towed behind a, a ship and then he would look underwater for um, artifacts or, or things that looked man-made. Um, also, what even makes this more unique is Art McKee in this, this famous picture is diving um, one of the Miami Miller Dunn dive and hood helmets, uh, which is an open bottom Florida, um, Florida helmet. And uh, this is another picture of uh, Dr. Joe and Ms. Marie. Um, preparing the exhibits. And a lot of restoration took place to uh, open the museum. And I also want to add this too, when I was uh, meeting with Sally leading up to the presentation, I, I used the word um, finished uh, before they opened in October 2005. And uh, Sally corrected me and said, a museum is never finished. Um, it's, it's always something that's, that's a work in progress. So, um, Perhaps it was finished enough to open, but it, it has continued to be a work in progress um, even to today. So in October 2005, they opened the museum part time. Um, and again, as, as Sally said, um, they, they started doing the Immerse Yourself series and uh, they would open a new exhibit every month. So this is my next outline for um, the history after the opening of the museum. Uh, where they started the monthly presentations and the part-time opening in October 2005. Uh, there was a full-time opening in December 2006. And again, a museum is never finished. Uh, and that would be from December 2006 to the present. And I included some before and afters of uh, the exhibits when they first uh, opened um, and some of the updates that were more recent. So this was Dr. Joe giving one of his Immerse Yourself series presentations, which we are uh, keeping going even to today. This was the outside of the museum. Uh, and this was um, some of the advertisements from the uh, Immerse Yourself series over the years. And, and you can see um, they've developed and some of them look like they're, they're more there from their time. And, um, you know, these, these, uh, presentations are definitely a part of the history of the museum. So the first uh, part of the museum is uh, breath hold diving. Uh, and, and I'm going to kind of go through some of the, the exhibits of the museum. And, uh, and this would be the first part here, which is um, the first divers were held their breath underwater. They, they didn't have diving apparatus. And uh, at the time, they would they would dive for food. They would dive for um, uh, oysters, and they would dive for pearls and and uh, lost and sunken treasure. Uh, and breath hold diving was an important part of this. So there are exhibits in the museum that are um, that are uh, in ode to the breath hold divers. I'm going to start to move a little quicker through this as we're approaching. Uh, 8 p.m. Uh, this, this is now the breath hold diving exhibit after uh, it's been redone. Uh, Halley's Bell. Um, most of you may know Edmund Halley from Halley's Comet, but uh, I would say that his more important contribution was actually to diving. And uh, he created what was called this diving bell, which is a similar effect to uh, the South Florida diving helmets, which were open underneath. And this was uh, Dr. Joe building the, uh, our replica diving bell at the museum. This is our whimsical machines exhibit. Uh, and this is how it used to look. Um, I remember, and you can see um, some of these books in here were our pieces of paper. And I remember as I was studying archives at uh, Auburn University, and uh, we used to have the actual book in here and uh, as I started to learn about, um, you know, the disintegration of paper and, and things of that nature, we, we pulled those books out. And again, it, it kind of goes back to museum is never finished and, and you learn things along the way. And 
Um, but this, this was the initial exhibit and uh, th this helped to get the museum open. And this is the, this is the exhibit today. Uh, the next exhibit is diving helmets. Um, and uh, Augusta Seavey was really um, influential, uh, basically the father of, of diving helmets. And uh, this changed diving as we know it, where we started pumping air down to a diver. And uh, this really took the world by storm and, and started the, the curious diving culture that we have today. This is now part of the uh, uh, helmet diving uh, exhibit and goes into our new uh, working divers uh, exhibit as it is today. Next is the scuba section. And this is Hans Haas, a favorite or uh, a famous uh, diver himself and photographer. This is actually Sally's old, uh, I wouldn't even call it old, it's in such great shape, uh, diving equipment and uh, as we all know, um, diving equipment has a tendency, uh, scuba diving equipment in particular, has a tendency to disintegrate and fall apart. Um, so it's nice that we've been able to preserve some of this uh, older diving, uh, scuba diving equipment. Uh, this is part of the new exhibit for uh, breath hold diving. And then here's our, this is a very new exhibit for uh, uh, free diving. Uh, so the South Florida uh, diving history is some of the most important history and there was a company called the Miller Dunn uh, Company out of Miami and they created these open bottom helmets and again in, in the South Florida waters that are, are so warm uh, this was a very helpful tool uh, especially to bridge builders uh, but others adopted these uh, style of helmets and uh, these three helmets are called the diving hoods and it went from the dive and hood one, uh, the dive and hood two in the center, and the dive and hood three. Uh, the dive and hood two is uh, it, a very important helmet to this museum. It is uh, the symbol on my, my shirt here and, uh, and throughout the museum. And it is uh, a very unique looking helmet. Um, it almost looks medieval. And uh, it has an important part of the history here in the Florida Keys. So this was the Dive and Hood 1. And this is again me putting uh, the Dive and Hood 1, which was 94 years old and uh, um, created on the same year that, uh, uh, that Ms. Marie was born. And uh, she was able to dive the helmet. And there she is underwater. Uh, William Beebe was a famous um, ornithologist turned uh, marine biologist and he was one of the first ones to really use the diving hood too. And uh, he is somebody that we celebrate in the museum with an exhibit, uh, William Beebe, and uh, in his Arcturus uh, ship where he did a lot of his um, marine biology. And uh, if you haven't been in the museum, this is another one of my, my favorite exhibits. And um, just hearing about the history um, or, or reading some of the, the materials on William Beebe is, is really neat. Um, he, he just talked about how, you know, the world came to life underwater um, for him after uh, using this diving hood. Uh, before marine biology was a very destructive um, endeavor where they would um, pull things from the bottom of the ocean and, and, um, and you know, in nets and, and bring them on, on you know, the boat and out of the water and out of their natural environment. And now he could go underwater and, and see these, um, um, these wonders. So his writing is, is an ode to these, um, these things that he saw through the lens of a diving hood. Here's the diving hood three. And the diving hood three was an important helmet to um, more sport diving. But again, Art McKee, uh, who's an important uh, figure in, in Isla Mirada. Um, he actually owned the building where Treasure Village is. Uh, he used the helmet for what was considered the first um, taking dive trips out and sport diving and um, bringing visitors to the Keys underwater. Um, so this could very well be um, 
the first time uh, people were taken out for tours for diving. And this is McKee's exhibit in the museum. And again, this is uh, Beebe's lab. And this is his ship, the Arcturus. I'm going to move through these a little bit faster. Um, this was the Miller Dunn exhibit uh, being built. And then this was it being completed. And then this is how it looks now. Uh, homemade diving helmets. This is another one of my favorite exhibits. And uh, these are sort of an ode to the open bottom helmets as well. And uh, these are these are very fun helmets. Uh, a lot of kids like this section. Um, it, it's really shows um, the ingenuity of, of um, the ingenuity of people and um, they all have one thing in common that they're open bottom but they're all very unique in their own respect and this is how the this is how the exhibit used to look and this is how it looks now uh, we have an exhibit to um, 20,000 leagues under the sea and this is part of the exhibit again the parade of nations which is really the premier exhibit. This is Dr. Joe um, constructing how these helmets would be floating on the screen. And uh, they would use these sort of arms attached to a rod and a pole, um, which were manufactured and welded. Uh, the Mark V is my favorite helmet. It is I believe the most iconic helmet. Uh, when I think of a diving helmet in my head, I conjure up an image of uh, the Mark V. This was a military helmet and uh, there were obviously the Mark V, there were four iterations before the Mark V. And uh, some of them look like a Mark V uh, as you get to around the Mark IV, but the first helmet doesn't very much look like one. Um, but this is our exhibit, um, which is an ode to uh, Navy diving. Underwater lighting. And uh, this is an exhibit that's been updated. And this is what it looks like now. And the last exhibit is the deep diving abyss. And this is where um, a, lot of the, a lot of the diving apparatus that we've talked about already, the uh, Iron Duke and Iron Mike are in the, the deep abyss. Um, and a lot of these machines were used to go um, in deep and cold water. And uh, they, they were very unique um, in their own respect. A lot of times what they discovered was a lot of these joints um, leaked. And uh, there's actually um, one uh, turret in the center of the exhibit and uh, which doesn't have any arms or joints. And what they found was um, the turret was better to uh, simply go down and observe. And a lot of these, they actually had trouble using them to uh, uh, accomplish any real work. Um, this is our most recent acquisition uh, to the museum uh, for the one atmosphere suits. This is the gym suit. And this is uh, one of our board members, John Hazelbaker, um, helping to bring this uh, this new item to the abyss. This is Sally as it was being brought into the museum. And this is the gym suit in the back left corner where it now sits. And uh, this is the turret in the center. And uh, that's Iron Duke on the right. And then on this very far right, you can see Iron Mike. Uh, even the Immerse Yourself lecture series has had updates. My PowerPoint just froze. Okay. Um, they used to hold the uh, presentations in the lobby, and now they're they're held or were held um, pre-COVID in the uh, library. The exterior facade has had updates. Um, these were some of the earliest pictures. This was the first awning on the museum shop, which uh, the Bowers realized quickly needed to go because. Uh, 
people would mostly come in the museum believing it was a dive shop and uh, for some reason didn't have interest in going through the museum. And they put this yellow awning onto the museum. They've added a beautiful mansard uh, to the side of the museum and they put this, uh, we put this submarine on the side. And this is currently what the exterior of the museum looks like. Even our signage has improved. Um, these were some of the initial drawings and ideas, sketches for the, uh, the sign. This is what, this was the first sign on the bottom left. And this was the second, um, this was the sketch for the, the new sign on the right. And this is our, our new sign. I believe it's been there about five years. And this is um, our helmet design for the Miller Dunn, for the Miller Dunn Dive and Hood 2. So these are just some extra photos here, but uh, I wanna thank everybody for uh, watching my presentation and bearing through it. Um, again, this museum means a lot to me and uh, it, it has a great history and I hope to be here and, and uh, potentially presenting to you in the next 15 years. And uh, thank you everybody for attending and cheers to the museum. Thank you everybody. <laughs> awesome. awesome, thank you, thank Chris. You, Chris. Let me get Lisa back on here as well. And oh, that's Lisa, are you there? Yeah. I am here. Okay, let me. All right, we're gonna do I gotta get out of the sharing. I'm I'm taking controls away from you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we should all right. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I I've seen some of those pictures in the past, but not all of them. And it is, it, you know, being associated with the museum for about 10 years now, I've seen some of that, but the early pictures go way, way back. So we appreciate your, uh, your time. We appreciate everything you do on the board. And actually, as a thank you, we have a uh, extending your uh, membership for another year, your Mark V membership. And, um, things that you do on the board. So we'll, we'll give you your package before you leave tonight. Um, so everybody, thank you for, for staying. We we're, went a little bit over and uh, you can pop in questions to Emily and we'll shoot you emails and some responses. But I also wanted to let you know, or if you don't get our email, sign up for it, go on to our website, sign up for it. Because some of the things, Chris, you reminded me that We've got an upcoming um, kind of virtual event where you can get your picture made into a vintage suit. And Emily was very creative. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about that, Emily? And oh, <laughs> oh so a surprise, <laughs> throw me under the bus on that one. <laughs> well, you, you, you got to play with them all. So That's, yeah, people I are can... gonna have a choice of three different pictures. Yes, yeah, so what we're gonna be doing um, is you'll be able to submit a photo to me and what I'll be able to do depending on the angle and I'm going to sh pull up an example here for a second and see Lisa I'm going to use you as the example for it because it oh, there you that, go. Worked, that one worked out pretty well if I can find where you are in my documents I would have I would have had this prepared a little bit better um, oh that's okay well, if they get our email, they can see them. It's That's, yeah, cool. it's actually, here we go. Let me, so what we'll do, the glories of technology. <laughs> it's just so fun. It, it, it is. And so what you'll be able to do, for example, here is a photo of our wonderful favorite, Mr. William Beebe in, I don't even know what kind of open bottom weird helmet this is. It kind of looks like something you'd put a cake under. But <laughs> so I, I've taken this photo and then you have the ability to put yourself in Mr. Beebe's place. So, <laughs> Isn't that fun? So we'll be working on that and I'll have that soon on our um, website that you guys will be able to, you know, choose what kind of photos and everything 
um, and placement of photos, kind of have fun for social media or, you know, fun little holiday gifts and things like that. And then the images will be sent to you as like a JPEG or PNG. So you'll be able to do whatever you want with them. So kind okay. of a fun little thing. And I do have a couple questions. Oh, I believe this is from Sally. Chris, what updates to the museum have either surprised or impressed you most? Um, I think that one of the things that I had pushed Sally early on, and I, I know this is almost going to sound sacrilegious, but um, the exterior needed some updating. And I think that it wasn't drawing in enough people driving south. Um, so I had recommended to Sally that we needed to paint over the side of the museum uh, and update it to make it look more like Worldwide Sportsman. And I was wrong. I, that wasn't what it needed. Um, and the updating on the side of the facade, I think really made the museum fit more what was in the museum, um, which is really just a, a unique collection. And uh, I think right after we had, we had put on the new uh, mansard, and uh, did the updates outside. Um, and I'm sure Lisa could tell you the numbers more, but uh, you know, the number of people who started coming to the museum went, went way up. So um, that, that really surprised me. And I think that that was a really um, positive thing because I always felt that there was a special collection in here, but there was something about the exterior that um, what wasn't drawing drivers by to, to come into the museum. That's, that's pretty good. And then I have had several people, you know, they really like the presentation and everything. And Kurt thinks we need to do a behind the scenes tour of the museum. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he also now has a question. Chris, based on your experience over the history of the museum, what do you think should be the next acquisition? That's actually an easy one. Um, I think that with um, sea level rise, I think that there's potential for us to have, um, you know, more flooding. Um, just I think that hurricanes are going to happen with more frequency and with more intensity. And uh, there are artifacts and, and things in this museum that um, probably belong in a safer place. Uh, I think that the museum could have an archives in perhaps a smaller uh, satellite museum in a, in a safer place. Um, but it's mainly the preservation of the archives that, that you know, concern me. And uh, I think that that has been on, on the Bowers radar probably for forever, um, having um, some other place to house the archives. But I think that that would be a, a nice update. Excellent. That's, yeah. We should be able to protect our stuff before we get more stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's basically we're good on that. Oh, oh somebody. Okay. Um, Dottie, she just said people driving south are excited to reach their destinations first. A museum takes a good chunk of time to go through. And that is something I think, you know, in general, we'll, we're all trying to work on. You know, I'd say, I think we tell people on average that you spend about an hour, give or take. You know, obviously we have some people coming through quickly, but maybe that is part of it. If we have a satellite museum somewhere else, we'll have, you know, more folks visit those too with, with more time if they're more permanent residents, so. But. Well, Lisa, Chris, anything right. from either of you? I think it's time to sign off. Thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate everything you do. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sally, who is on um, mute and hidden someplace. But if it wasn't for her and Dr. Joe, we wouldn't be here tonight. So happy 15th anniversary of the History of Diving Museum. And cheers. I have a little left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was great. Thank you everybody for joining in and we'll see you next month on the 18th. Okay. All right. All see right. you then. <laughs> Bye.
Bye, everyone. Bye.